Uh, Charles Severance is, um, I guess you're a member of one of a group at the University of Michigan that does collaborative science and, and other research. One of the probably earliest of such groups. Um, so, but he's best known at Rutgers as the architect of Sakai, but actually has broader interests, and I think we're going to hear this morning more about e-science and, and Sakai, which is, is what, what I asked him to do, so I'll turn it over to Chuck Severance. Thank you, the other Dr. Chuck. Um, so uh, those of you listening remotely, uh, if you're having trouble seeing the slides, go to www.dr-chuck.com. Um, and go to my talks, and this is the first talk. So you can click on this talk and download the slides. Um, I have 70 slides and 40 minutes, so we'll probably skip a few. So this is the rough outline. Um, uh, looking a little bit back at the last 15 years of collaborative e-science, looking at putting the collaboration part into e-science, doing a little bit of a understanding of how I see the current uh, lay of the land in terms of collaborative e-science, how repositories, portals, and collaborative software can work together, then taking a bit of a reflection and looking back on that 15 years of activity, asking a few questions like, what's wrong with middleware um, and authorization and authentication? Are we there yet? And then I have this fantasy future case study that I hope I have time to get to. So this seems like a simple enough notion. You go grab a scientific domain, go find some people, figure out a common user interface to some cool nifty widgets, share some data both in the moment and in the long term over the lifetime of the field, go hook up some experimental equipment, do a little computing, a little visualization, new science happens, right? Seems simple enough. So as I mentioned, we've been doing this at Michigan for over 15 years now, starting in 1991. And just to give you a little context for those of you who don't remember 1991, that's before the World Wide Web became popular, right? Because like Gopher was 92. So we've been sort of trying to hook people together using the internet to do collaborative science for a long time. And the project that got us started down this path was a project called UARC, which would later transformed into a project called SPARC. UARC stands for Upper Atmospheric Research Collaboratory. And SPARC stands for Space Physics Aeronomy Research Collaboratory. So let's talk a little bit about SPARC and UARC. So this is a field of science where a bunch of people, and I'll probably oversimplify this greatly, and no one should take offense if I oversimplify this too much. I think of these as a bunch of people that live in little shacks in Greenland with the antennas pointed up to the sky, sort of wondering whether or not some little thing is going to go up or down. And there was lots of people around the world that had these little shacks with little antennas pointed up to the sky, and they didn't know about each other much. They meet once a year at a conference. So the whole idea of UARC and SPARC was to connect these people together, get them to work together both live and after the fact, and then do some nice outreach to the kiddies at K-12 schools as well. So at the end of the 10-year mission that we called UARC and SPARC at Michigan, we had quite a nice bit of software shown by these wonderful screenshots that we can't even fit on one screen. So let's talk a little bit about the Spark UARC software. It was absolutely written from scratch. Remember, we started in 1991. There was no middleware, there was no portals, there was no Eclipse, there was no plugins, no nothing. This software, thankfully, was rewritten and thrown away three times during the life of the project. We started writing on next step, so the only way you could work was to have a next. Remember, 1991, 1992. Then we threw that away when people didn't want next, and we rewrote it in a series of Java applets with some Java servlet technology in the back with REST-style web services. Then we threw that away. The browser became a cool thing finally, and we rewrote it kind of like a portal our own way. And by the end of the time, it was ready for its fourth rewrite. We had something cool that those screenshots were what we were doing at the end of 2001. So what was the keys to what we considered to be highly successful? In 2001, at the end, we had 600 data sources streaming that people could look at, fiddle with, play with. We were doing worldwide space weather forecasting with simulations and sharing the results. Um, it was quite exciting. So what was the key that made this a success? The first was, was 10 years of solid funding. 
not having to recompete for the same money over and over and over again. This led to team consistency and the team learned from its mistakes. The mistakes in 1992 were able to teach the team in 1997, 98, 99 so we could get success. We also evolved a long-term relationship, a highly respectful relationship between the IT people, the computer sci scientists and technologists, and the scientists, the domain scientists. And this relationship was kept gray, meaning there were talented people who were actual domain scientists and they actually were able to write software. So we kept the relationship between the domain scientists and the IT folks as gray as possible. Rewriting and throwing away software, that's always good. And we also invested a portion of our effort in evaluation and continuous feedback, feedback which the development team actually listened to and respected. So when the Spark thing ended, this was a blast. We had a great time, a lot of cool meetings, a lot of people got to know each other. You felt like you actually accomplished something in this field of space, physics, astronomy research. So the conclusions we kind of reached at the University of Michigan was getting people together is an important part of collaborative e-science. <clears throat> we, we embarked on a couple of different projects, a thing we called Work Tools, Chef, and now Sakai. The critical point we learned, though, is that collaborative software is only part of it. It's not the whole solution. So our idea at Michigan was, well, we've been playing around in this space building point solutions, so let's focus our talents on building reusable user interface technologies for the people part of collaborative e-science. So kind of our first reusable technology was what we called work tools. This was a Lotus Notes based system with a few little widgets added to it that we added. This was basically an organic single server approach. We had a work tool ser server running at Michigan for like a seven year period and we gave away accounts on it to anybody. Just gave them away. And so it's like people started using it. By, by the end of the project we had over 9,000 users, 2,000 of which would be active. We didn't recruit them, we didn't train them, we didn't do anything, we just made it available kind of like Yahoo eGroups except there's places for files etc. So this, this kind of led us to the thinking that an organic approach is a good approach to collaboration. Just give them a space to fiddle around and then let the scientists figure out what to do with that space. Lotus Notes is a little tough, especially now. Lotus Notes is pretty much deprecated completely. So in fall 2001, we said, well, we need something that's a little more hip, a little more standards oriented, and a little future proof. So we created a thing called CHEF, the Comprehensive Collaborative Framework. And basically it was all Java, all open source from the beginning. We, we, we tried to create a community, we had workshops, et cetera, et cetera. And it was all funded internally at the University of Michigan from the CIOs and the provosts at that time because we had internal reasons to want to build software like this. We had three or four major applications and there's many outside of uh, University of Michigan that used Chef. The course tools, we, we used it for our teaching and learning environment inside University of Michigan. We replaced our loaded snow space work tools with Chef, NISGRID, which I'll talk about in a little bit, and the NSF National Middleware Grid Portal Initiative uh, used Chef and now later using Sakai. So I'll talk a little bit about NISGRID. So NISGRID is a 15 experimental sites connected by a large bunch of software. NISGRID was the name of that software. NIS was the Network for Earthquake Engineering and Simulation. This was a large NSF effort. It was effectively and I believe it's probably unique in that it is to some degree field-wide, meaning there's very little NSF-funded <coughs> research activity in earthquake engineering that's not part of NEETS. They put all the eggs in one basket as a collaborative infrastructure connect, to connect these, diver, the, these, these diverse set of experimental facilities with simulation, et cetera, et cetera. So we were part of this just only one part of it, we built a collaborative environment and then built a series of portlets that ran in that collaborative environment, some of which were just completely generic stuff that we were using elsewhere and others of which were very unique to the earthquake engineering field. In the upper right hand corner of my slide is a visualization mechanism that was allowed to bring video and data together with a scrubbing line so you could do very fine grained relationship between a series of video cameras and a series of data. It turns out in the earthquake engineering world, everything is two minutes long that matters. This is a natural constraint of the earthquake engineering field. 
even though you might do a multi-week simulation, at the end of the day, you're really visualizing about two minutes of data because that's how it is. So we were able to take advantage of some of the natural constraints and build some pretty nifty tools that worked very nicely. So we found things unique to that field, built them, but then reused common collaborative components as well to give the scientists absolutely much more than just a set of tools. Another very important part of the, the NICE effort was a two-year effort with four to six people to try to come up with a data model that could unify the field. We had a pretty good data model at the end, but it, it was a little too complex and a little too unwieldy, and we're still working on that. But this was basically a data modeling effort where the field tried to get together and build data models that allowed the different variants of the field and the subfields within earthquake engineering to be able to share data amongst themselves. <clears throat> Another thing that we worked hard on was uh, capturing data from experiments and allowing remote telepresence. We adopted a technology called Data Turbine, where we basically captured and timestamped all the data. We captured and timestamped still images. We captured and timestamped video. And then we effectively made a Data TiVo. And the Data TiVo allowed us to look at the various channels, the various video channels, and then in live you could back up. One of the things that happens in pseudodynamic experiments is they're simulating things for like a week. The problem with earthquake engineering is it often takes months to prepare a specimen and at the end of the experiment you destroy it. And so you've got to be real careful as the experiment is running because once you destroy it, you've you got to go a few months before you start it up. So it turns out that having humans in the loop during the simulation is really important because you can just hit the wrong button and smash it and then you have to start over. So there's a lot of careful steering and even people jabbering at each other and say, no, 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 slow it down, slow it down, no, speed it up, slow, wait, 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 You're, that crack is moving too fast. So it turns out that there's a lot of interactivity in some of these long-running experiments. So we needed people from all over the world to be able to participate in voting or even shouting about how it was going to be that this experiment was going to be steered for the next four to six hours. Or we're going to leave it overnight and then we're going to come back and the darn thing's broken and, you know, we thought we were going to have two to three more weeks of data. And so this notion of data TiVo where the experiments are there and you can sneak back, you can find this part where a crack forms and a little, little burst of energy comes out, you have to watch that and you've got to catch the, the little things. It's, it's really cool stuff. If I had more time, I'd show you some of the cool videos. So then that was kind of the, the end of the chef era and that then the beginning of the Sakai era. era. So we have to explain to some degree what is the name Sakai and what does it mean? Well, it was named after a guy. His name was Hiroki Sakai, and he's a star of the Food Channel program Iron Chef. And uh, he's renowned for his fusion of French and Japanese cuisine. And he's there on top in the food forum or whatever it's called. Well, it turns out that Joseph Harden, the uh, PI of Sakai and uh, one of the people instrumental in the creation of uh, Mosaic at NCSA, now at University of Michigan, his lovely wife Susan, also from NCSA formerly, now at University of Michigan, um, they were going to Japan and they were given a bunch of talks in Japan. And it turns out that Hiroki is an adjunct faculty member at Hosei University in the School of Cuisine. And one of the places that Joseph was visiting was Hosei University. So they pulled a few strings and they went to host uh, Hiroki's restaurant one evening that they knew he was going to be there and they presented him with a nice chef hat with a Sakai logo on it. Up to this point, we were a little nervous about being sued by the use of the name Sakai. We might have called it Hedrick, but then Chuck would probably sue us because it wouldn't be called Hedrick. So people would ask us, are you going to get sued? Well, Hiroki didn't speak much English and he laughed quite a bit. So our first guess was he probably's not going to sue us. He thought it was pretty funny that a bunch of American crazies had made this really cool piece of software and named it after him. But people have since pointed out that maybe he was laughing because he figured out who he was going to sue. Up to that point, he just didn't know who he was going to sue. Ah! Avatars. I don't want any avatars. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about what Sakai is. Sakai is a collaboration and learning environment. If you look down these capabilities, announcements, assignments, chat room, threaded discussion, Dropbox, email archive, messages of today, news, preferences, you only see a few of them that really look like teaching and learning. Lots of people use Sakai initially as a teaching and learning environment. Sakai is kind of unique in open source as a teaching and learning environment 
because it's really the only open source collaboration and learning environment that's aimed at enterprise deployments. Sakai is designed as a teaching and learning environment to come out of the box and satisfy 100,000 users. Very few other open source products say when they come out of the box, you buy a little hardware, you plug it in, turn it on, and you will support 100,000 users. Now, we have always been very passionate about the research aspects of Sakai. So we felt from the beginning and from our use of Lotus Notes and others that there was tremendous overlap between research collaborations, ad hoc collaborations, and teaching and learning. So my goal as Chief Architect of Sakai is to try to convince people who are writing new capabilities, who think they're writing for one of many different applications of Sakai, to move those towards the center to make them generic reusable collaborative components. So something that we thought was useful only for research in earthquake engineering turns out might be quite useful for other fields of research or even completely even useful inside of a teaching context. So Sakai starts out as a competitor in a way to teaching and learning environments like WebCT, Blackboard and Angel and Moodle as well as generic collaborative environments like Lotus Notes and Windows SharePoint. And we hope that as we move forward, we can maintain this ability to satisfy both these customer bases. Both groups we hope to be able to maintain as we go forward. Looking forward a bit on Sakai, there's a number of tools that are under additional development. There's a wiki that's now part of our release. There's a blog that may be part of our next release. There's a shared, the simple shared display mechanism, a simple shared whiteboard, multicast audio, and multicast video. Keep using the word simple there. They're all very simple. Now, the people who built these tools, actually, they started thinking about this from a research perspective. They are using this for humanities and social science collaborations. But if you look at it, that's fine for use in teaching and learning as well. So I didn't have to do much to these folks, but they came at it, their funding, their motivation, their whole purpose was for research collaboration. So they use Sakai as a research collaboration tool. They're building these, these new capabilities. I snatch them and I put them in our release and our teaching and learning people can benefit. The opposite also happens. People in teaching and learning, like Indiana builds something like Message Center or uh, Foothill builds a thing called JForum. You put those into Sakai and they might also be used in, in research as well as teaching. So we think that the confluence between teaching and research is a place where we can effectively gather resources and talent for people interested in either one. Another thing that happened at the, as when, with the, the end of CHEF and now Sakai is the National Middleware Initiative. Ah, come back. And the National Middleware Initiative is an effort, let's see if that's a good place to put it is an effort that brings together a number of grid computing activities to try to build a user interface to the grid. Chef and now Sakai is a critical part of this effort. Now this effort produced a couple of different products, but in a way it produced much more than that. In a way it produced much more than this. This was a talk I gave in, uh, in Italy in a very beautiful uh, cliff town called Vico Aquens in Italy in 2004. And I drove basically the kind of the lineage, the family history of a series of grid portal projects. And basically it really breaks down into three basic phases of grid portals. In the beginning, we all competed with one another. Michigan competed with Indiana, competed with University of Texas, competed with those people from Europe, you know, blah, blah, blah. And then what happened is we started deciding that we just would not survive if we kept fighting all the time. So people like Mary Thomas and Dennis Gannon of, uh, of Texas and San Diego and in Indiana said, let's create a super group. So the NMI, the OGCE NMI project, Open Grid Computing Environment, began to bring these efforts together. And so you see this convergence. This convergence was conscious. This was a conscious effort on the part of people who maybe could have won and competed against the others and beat the heck out of each other and then won or lost. But instead of fighting, we decided to pool our efforts and pool our talents. So as we converged the market, a bunch of these older technologies just went away and we produced ability to put each of our best technologies together. Now if I fast forward now to 2006, we see even further convergence. The one thing 
that was outside of our family was Gridsphere, which is the European effort, which is a very popular e-research portal effort. So what happened is now we're working on our next generation of funding, and we're even converging farther. We effectively have brought Gridsphere into the family, and we're working on the funding. We're, we have a proposal in to uh, Mary Ann Scott, who you sp saw speak this morning. We don't know if it'll be funded or not, but you know what? It, hopefully Mary's not listening right now. It hardly matters whether we're funded or not, because we as a group are like our own little field. We as a group have decided we're going to work together rather than fighting with one another. And if Mary Ann chooses to fund us, well, that'll be even more motivation, but it doesn't matter. The decision has been made that we're going to work together. So here's the picture that is part of our proposal for the next generation. And basically, you see all kinds of things in here. The idea is that to bring all these technologies together into a single product that you can, you can install and create portals to your heart's content. Now, Sakai, for me, is very precious, but it's really, really tiny. It's in the bottom middle of the thing. It's just one word. As a matter of fact, I think we only have about two paragraphs in the whole proposal. And, and they use the, the word commodity portlets. I mean, how demeaning to a research place like us to call us commodity portlets. I don't think that's demeaning at all. It means what we provide in Sakai is a set of services that are useful to the rest of e-research. So now I want to talk a little bit about how I see us living in collaborative e-science right this minute. The key is, is that it's not about one technology. It's about orchestrating many technologies with interoperability. And I group these things roughly as collaborative tools, portals, large data sources, knowledge building tools, data repositories, and sh shared compute. And there's technologies that fit in each of these places like Lobus and Sakai and Gridsphere. And, and D2K and Kepler and SRB and Fedora. So we see these things that fit these spaces. It's silly to pretend that Sakai is going to be so awesome that it's going to include D2K, that somehow Sakai can compete with D2K or Kepler as a workflow engine. It's absolutely ludicrous to imagine that. Or to somehow imagine that Sakai is a better repository than Fedora or SRB. It's absolutely ludicrous. So the key thing is, instead of fighting with it, you join with these folks and you work on it. I still believe that portals for now are an important technology. If you're going to build a portal interface, uh, interface to whatever widget that you are, you should use a standard. And JSR 168 portals are the standard today. But be careful because there are new portals, new portal technologies. Things like Mambo and Joomla are far more agile than something like a JSR 168 portal. So the key thing is always understand the science community that you're dealing with, and if agility is something you need, be careful. JSR 168 might be just a little slow for you. And then the other thing to keep track of is portals are still, even even now, Joomla, UPortal, Gridsphere, they may only be an intermediate step in the process. Desktop applications are what we tend to, to use. How many people use the web-based version of Outlook if you have a choice? The answer is nobody. Why? Because drag and drop and all the highly interactive capabilities. Now maybe we'll get that from the web. Maybe we won't. But the bottom line is, is highly interactive scientific applications are what people ultimately want. So we should never ignore desktop applications and never pretend. If you look at some of the new next generation portal standards like WSRP 2.0 and JSR 286, they really aimed at bringing, bringing portlet technology onto desktops as independent windows. So even if we build portlets, we may still start seeing those as independent windows. So portlets may not, as, may not be as, as much a short-term thing as we think. In Sakai, we're already working with a project called Plex, P-L-E-X, out of the JISC UK, and, and it's out of JISC and CETUS, which is, they call it the personal learning environment. I call it the personal learning and research environment. Um, but their funding is for teaching and learning, so they don't call it that. Um, but basically, it's a, it's a smart bookmarking, it's a personal, think of it as like an iTunes for your research. iTunes does not make music, does not edit music, does not do anything with music except organize it. So imagine an iTunes for your research work. It's not the thing that holds all your assets, but it organizes those assets in a way that's useful to you, and then you download them and carry them around in your pocket and listen to them, if that's what you need to do. So the first thing I want to talk about, and I'll skip most of the slides on this, I, uh, they're up on the web and you're welcome to see them. I want to talk a little bit about the portal. <clears throat> we used to think that Sakai was supposed to be a portal. 
But we realized that ultimately Sakai was not a very good portal, and portal was not a very good Sakai. And the problem is, is that portals are really very enterprise oriented. They are outbound communication of a set of channels that the user gets to arrange in a certain way. But those channels are rather publish oriented. Maybe there's email, maybe there's a few other things. So the, the, the portal environment is very much about the organization's outward face. And again, don't just think JSR 168 and Java portals. Think also things like Joomla, Mambo, RSS feeds, et cetera, et cetera. These are very much publishing activities, not collaborative, highly interactive activities. Whereas Sakai is all about moment-by-moment -moment high speed collaboration. People are sending emails, getting emails, chatting, uploading files, saying, hey, I just put this file up, blah, 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 blah. Sakai is an application. There's a relationship between them, but they're not the same thing. And so organizations like the Sakai project itself as both a portal and a collaboration environment. Our job now is to hook them together better. We Sakai use Mambo for our portal and we use Sakai for our collaboration environment. So we have this portlet that drops into a JSR 168 compliant portal that is a combination of putting a whole Sakai site into a portal or putting proxy versions of Sakai tools into those portals with placements. And these are the slides I'm going to roar through. It uses web services and it's 100% stock JSR 168. This is, this is what it looks like where the outside is a portal and the inside is Sakai. That's called the gallery view. There's also a tree view of Sakai where all the Sakai sites have been retrieved by web services. The portal is actually rendering the entire navigation structure of Sakai in the portal and then each tool is brought up by Sakai um, as the person selects that. That's how that works. Here's an example of a simple single tool placement within Sakai that's living inside the portal. Now it turns out this is very useful for people who are just doing a little bit of collaboration. They use their portal as the main thing and then pop a calendar in there as needed and then they, they don't have to worry about it. The calendars pick from the Sakai, the proxy calendars have, have the capability of picking which Sakai site they're proxying and that's how that works and that's some web services that you're welcome to look at uh, from the, uh, my website. Let me do it time wise. Uh, another five minutes. Another five minutes. <laughs> uh, Two. Yeah. Ten minutes. Eleven minutes. Okay. So this is Sakai repository integration approach very rapidly. So I'm going to discuss this important relationship between Sakai and repositories. Repositories and collaboration systems are not the same thing. Repositories are about high quality information that has long life cycles with extremely rich metadata. Collaboration systems are about one third of a, one -third of a second response time for 10,000 simultaneous users. These aren't the same problem. So basically, one of the things that we want to do, especially for eScience, is the ability to take the entire Sakai activity and archive it in a Fedora-like repository. Because we believe that in a Nice-like situation where people are both taking data and screaming at one another at the same time, we want to hear what they were talking about in addition to what the data was. Because if there's someone said, no, stop, stop, unhook that thing, and all of a sudden the data goes to zero, you can understand, it. oh, that must be why the data went to zero, right? So we think of the collaborative activity properly annotated with proper metadata, and Sakai does that. It captures very rich metadata for every activity that goes on inside Sakai. When it happened, who did it, how that was done, we want to capture that in the long term and put that into a data repository. And then you drop into your basic metadata, your data repository workflow where you ingest it, you clean it up, and then you put it in. And the whole idea here is in the long term, you should be able to eliminate Sakai from this picture. You know, five years from now, your Sakai site goes away, but your institutional repository has all that critical research data that was stored in Sakai. So that's why it's got to be pulled out. Then once this data is made useful inside of the repository, you can bring it back and keep careful metadata provenance as the data moves back and forth and around and around you go. So we're really into RDF in terms of how we want to deal with our repositories. The key thing we like about RDF is that we believe it has high fidelity movement of data between disparate systems. Things like XML and schema have the problem of translating upon each system to system boundary. 
So RDF has the ability to not be translated as the data moves. Because you could even imagine an institutional repository will itself have a life cycle. Every 15 years or so, we might throw away our entire institutional repository structure and want to move the data. So if you think 50 years, that means that the data, and we're using XML schema-based approaches, the data was downsampled to get from Sakai to the first repository, downsampled again to get to the second repository, downsampled again to get to the third repository, downsampled again. There's nothing left by the time you've downsampled it. Whereas if you start with RDF, you may not understand all the RDF in repository one, but you have a perfect representation of what Sakai was thinking at that moment. And maybe that repository never really even understands it at all until 10 years later you move it into a different repository that now begins to understand that RDF. The key is, is the original asset is unchanged as it moves through successive repository iterations. So we're doing some work with Fedora. This is a simple move toward a Sakai tool that talks to Fedora web services and puts stuff in the background. Uh, one of our developers, Beth Kirshner, is working on this. Um, Interestingly, these are a bunch of earthquake engineering samples. So, some reflections on all this. So I said I'd ask two questions toward the end. One is, where's the middleware in us picture? <clears throat> so, is the middleware in the middle? Is the middleware the universal connector? Is the middleware that thing through which all communication must pass? Or it's not allowed? This is, the, this is the typical middleware slide that most middleware architects draw. <clears throat> but the problem here is then the middleware becomes the rate limiting factor. It means that whatever middleware you choose, if it's slow or complex or unreliable, that middleware is your rate limiting factor. I want to enable people to work in PHP, .NET, Perl, Java. I like Java, but that doesn't mean everybody's going to work in Java. It's just not the nature of things. Too many people, I think it's a terrible thing, we use Perl, but I'm not going to stop them. Okay? They even use Emacs. I can't stop that either. Many things I can't stop. The point is, is to, to insert middleware in the middle and, and ins insist that middleware touch every single transaction makes middleware the rate limiting factor. So the kind of universal connectors that we see are things like SOAP, things like HTTP, web services as true standards evolve and they're really ubiquitous across languages. Fine, that's cool. But creating effectively experimental web services and saying you got a port to experimental web services to call it middleware, I think that's a terrible mistake. Things like TCP IP. So universal connectors is not the middleware. So is middleware something we stick inside each of these applications? Well, I've never seen any middleware that works like this because some of those are written in .NET, some of those are written in Perl, some are written in PHP, Visual C++, who knows what. There's no middleware that's worthy of being inside each of these applications. There's subtle domain-specific middleware that's quite useful inside one of these application silos, but not necessarily as the uni unifying connection between them all. So it turns out that the most useful middleware is just another circle. It's a piece of technology that is used, it's just another component that's only used when it's needed. Okay? It's only used when it's needed. It's not something that is the uniform it's not like TCP IP. It is, middleware is something that you use. It is not something through which all activity passes. Ah, ah. Oh my good slides, I hit the wrong one. So now I want to talk last about this identity and access control bubble, which is of some interest to the Internet 2 community. This is an important part of middleware. As a matter of fact, it's potentially the single most important function of middleware, period. So let's talk about this. Here's a chalk talk again. So what we have in the, in the identity and access control is we have the competition phase, right? Everybody seems to have some middleware to solve this problem. And I'm sitting here with a piece of chalk and trying to wonder how are these things going to come together? And yeah, there's a project grid shift. That's pretty cool. That'd be nice. But really what we need is we need a single thing that brings this all together. And I'll tell you how long it took for portals to get here. It took four years for portals to get to the point, maybe six or seven. So I'm a little worried about the identity and access control. Getting out of the competition phase to the collaboration phase to the conversion phase is years of effort, frankly. And who's going to fund it? So basically, the goal state is one server, one software distribution, that includes virtual organization software, supports all the protocols, Globus, CA, Shibboleth, LDAP, MyProxy, Kerberos, dot, dot, dot. The problem is, who's going to do it? 
Who's going to pay for the money for this? And who can get these current competitors to actually cooperate and quit building competitive solutions and then competing with one another? So whenever faced with a problem like this, my solution usually involves airplanes and fine food. And so I've actually been running around and talking to people. And uh, from upper left, that's the, that's the flight to State College, Pennsylvania. Um, that's a pretty small airplane from Detroit to State College. Then um, in the middle, that's the, that's the lion's share people who are doing a lot of federated identity work with Shibboleth. Then that, that upper right there, that's the picture of how Shibboleth does federated identity. And it's a scary thing. I keep telling them, when you guys have it figured out, you give me a phone call. Then on the, on the middle, going from left to right, that would be Von Welsh and Jim Basney and others at NCSA where we're trying to draw some pictures. There's a center picture. The answer is on that center picture, but unfortunately the, I don't have the resolution to remember what it was. But I do know that we wrote it down in that room. The whole thing was solved on that one whiteboard in the middle. And of course we went and had some steak at Alexander's at NCSA afterwards. I recommend that place. Then I went to Australia in the lower left hand corner. And that's the people from the APAC, Australian National University. And in the middle there, this is the people that are doing the MAMS project, which is spearheading the deployment of Shibboleth, the production deployment of Shibboleth throughout Australia. So this takes you to the far corners of the world. And, uh, and, and of course, they often have good food in those far corners of the world. But basically, this to me is a work that's just beginning the convergence of this activity. So my e-science fantasy. This is my fantasy world. So here's the prerequisites. I don't know how this happens, but my I, I have so much money I can give myself grants. I don't have to apply for grants. I can give money away to anyone I feel like it, including myself and a whole bunch of programmers that do whatever I say. So then I encounter some tech-savvy scientists in a field who are using technology to do world-class research. They've never been visited by any other computer scientists who've come up with cool technology that they should have used. They're geographically distributed, and they all have a beach, internet too, and a favorable exchange rate and no password on their wireless. So that as I visit them all, I find it very, very pleasant. And then I get avatars. So this is a picture of this. We got some people doing experiments. I'm not sure the people in Siberia have a good beach. Some people doing remote observations, some people doing e-documents, some people doing tutorials. These are all one field. Heart research, maybe. Some people working on heart research data models, some compute, some guy's got a cluster, a little piece of heart simulation software, maybe some heart visualization software that requires some spinning to work in a web browser. Who knows what they do? But they do all these cool things and they don't know anything about each other. So what's the first step in my fantasy? Well, visit the scientists. Understand what they're doing, how they're doing it, ask them how to improve it. Then show each other, take these applications and show them to the other scientists. And then say that's the other scientists. How would you fix this one? Then what you do is you work with each group and you just help them do their work. Don't change it. Don't touch it. Leave it alone. Make it better. Just be nice. Live with them. Walk in their shoes for a while. Then you add some technology. By now we've invented the super multi-protocol virtual organization widget. Install it. Provide a simple knock so that people can get accounts and passwords on it. Start with simple identity and simple attributes. Got to install Sakai, of course. And use the VO software as the identity and access control for Sakai. Throw an icon into Sakai and give each scientist that you meet an account in their virtual organization and give each effort that you meet a separate site within Sakai, but then let them make new sites. So this is what it looks like. We got the Heart Study Collaboratory. We have site A, we have site B, we have site C, we have site D, E, and we even have an open forum so they can talk about office parties and stuff like that. So what we do is for little group B, which happened to be a little simulation of heart models, we, we, we just give them a bunch of tools, email, chat, replace the stick files, and then you just put an iframe into their original site that they started with in the first place. Now what do they do? You let them play around in this area. They get to know each other. People can go to one place. They can find it. They can chat with the owner. They can send email. There's archival. They can search among these things. It's really cool. Step two. Now it turns out somebody gets, finds out that, wow, that little heart model, I've only run it on a you know, Pentium 2 and everyone on the world wants to use it. I really want to share it with a few of my buddies that are in the VO. So now what you do, remember our VO software is multi-protocol. And so you say, look, we'll stick a single sign-on in front of your widget. I'll show you a little bit of Apache configuration magic to drop a shiv mod shiv in front of it. Configuration, and voila, now you're protected 
very simply. But because we can use any of these protocols, whether it's LDAP or SHIB or whatever, hopefully they didn't have to rewrite any of their code at this point. So at the end of steps one and step two, this is what we've got. We've got a collaborative environment that didn't hardly change a single thing. For those people that we felt like giving access control to, we've got a virtual organization server that gives them that. So then what's the next step? The next step is to start working on their data and start teaching them about data from a field-wide perspective. So come up with a unique identifier service like LSID, Life Sciences ID. Simple concept, but powerful. So you basically make it so that any member of the VO can grab an identifier any way they want, web services, Perl, who knows what. They'll create automated batch jobs that grab these identifiers, etc. Build a very simple data model around these identifiers and build a software environment that can hand these things up. Have, and have them start marking whatever it is that they're doing with these identifiers. Then begin to work on a common data model with folks. Make it very simple. Use RDF, but start with it so small that humans can read it at the beginning. Scientists do not like chunks of XML that humans can't read at the beginning. Until they get used to it, then you can make it bigger. Define a way in file systems to store this data. Simple, uh, simple extension, a way to mark this little metadata. It's a little blob in a file system. That's how it starts. Then build what I call a backup style repository. And the idea is, is it's like I can just build up a bunch of data on a, on a file system on my local laptop or whatever it is I want. I start sticking metadata in there with some Perl scripts or whatever it is I want. And now I want to put that thing centrally. And I just send it up. It's almost like a backup. But now I actually have metadata enhanced information with, even if it's only five fields, a common data model associated with each piece of information that I'm sending it up. The idea is by getting your identifier, you're also giving yourself backup space. So the identifier is the key that you back it up under that identifier. Use a lot of protocols. Now we have effectively a simple functioning data repository, a simple functioning a collaborative environment, and that's the first four years. Now I got like four more years. So what do we do? So this was all about taking the work that's going on and not screwing it up, adding value to it without harming the poor scientists in the meantime. So for four years we did good things for scientists without making them port to some other environment. So now what happens is now that you're working and basically functioning, now you can start introducing new technologies like JSR 168, portals, etc. Best practices, you have to teach the scientists now how to use best practices, leveraging off the data that's in the repository to build tools that everybody can do. And so teaching, evolving data, crossing stovepipes, etc. is something that you do after you've added some value to their lives. So this is what I call this. Science is at the center of e-science. The priorities start in the middle. You start with the science and the scientists. Never lose that as the focus. You connect and enhance and communicate without harming them is the first step. Then you begin to do data storage and data models and simple repositories that they can understand. And the final activity is teach them about new technologies, new approaches, and new tools. So, many years ago, 15, eScience had science as its focus, not technology. Custom approaches resulted in far too many solutions, so the natural instinct of computer scientists is look for that common underpinning that is the solution we call magic bullets. Unfortunately, too many groups started and too many groups found magic bullets. They now use their magic bullets to compete for funding and mind share to be the one true magic bullet. The only way to solve the multi-magic bullet problem is to create super groups that themselves resolve the differences between the magic bullets. It's hard to do, requires clever funding, requires active management on the part of funding agencies. No single technology gets to claim that they're, in the one, they're the one, they're the middle, that everyone must go through them to be effective. Each technology needs to be an auxiliary drop-in to be used when and if appropriate. And as soon as we can get past looking at technology as the main focus, we can get back to science as the main focus. So let's just take a look at why we started to do this in the first place. We had a scientific domain. We had a group of people. We wanted to make a common user interface, wanted to do short and long-term data sharing. We had to hook up some experimental equipment, compute, visualization. It just shouldn't be that hard. Okay, and to download that, go to www.drchuck.com and click on Chuck's Talks. Uh, I don't know how much time I have left. A couple minutes. A couple minutes. Okay, questions? I 
I guess that means I answered all the questions. Yeah. Do you think uh, so this system could involve some, some tools for, for, for computation, for example? Uh, so if you have databases, uh, which has other uh, So in, in, if you have re repositories uh, so included in the system, so you want to have some tools that will work with this data just, just on the web? Yes. So And this is already included or it is? Right. So, so I understand the, 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 let me see if I kind of understand the question. <clears throat> you have data in a data repository and you have some other situation, whether it be computer or some other tool, that wants to work with that data because that's the beginning of the value, right? That's the value add. And I sort of delay that to late in the process, right? A lot of things would say that you've got to connect those things as the first step. Um, and the answer is, that's when I, when I, I, I mean, I was zipping through slides at that point, but when I said that the data repository has to be equivalently multi-protocol, much like the identity server has to be equivalently multi-protocol, it has to be able to do grid FTP. So if you're running in a Globus cr cluster and you put your data in that thing, right, you better be able to get the data back by grid FTP because that is the context in which you want to use the data. If, on the other hand, you're sitting in a desktop environment and you want to get that data back by WebDAV because you're using a Visual Basic tool on desktop that happens to support WebDAV quite nicely, well, then I would want that data to be available in WebDAV. So the data repositories have to be equivalently multi-protocol, meaning supporting whatever protocol to allow. And so this repository doesn't exist either, right? This repository technology that I'm hypothesizing doesn't exist either. So we don't, again, it comes down to we can't find one, grid, grid FTP is not sufficient for all computational things that we do in all of IT, but grid FTP is useful in a large set of domains, very useful in a large set of domains. So think of grid FTP as one protocol that data repository is supposed to support, not the only protocol. Any other questions? Well, thank you very much for your time. And uh, send me an email if you have any other questions. Thanks.